Hey, Earth Science class. Let's finish up Chapter 3, Rocks, Materials of the Solid Earth. This is the metamorphic rock section of this chapter. So metamorphism means to change or to change form. So essentially what a metamorphic rock is, is a rock that's transitioned from either a sedimentary, an igneous, or an other metamorphic rock by increase in temperatures and pressures that are different from which it formed. Okay, so all the minerals we've talked about in these different rocks, they have stability limits, meaning like if you have a mineral in a rock and you start increasing its temperature, the mineral may no longer be stable. And same thing with pressure. If you have a rock, uh, say like a granite, an intrusive uh, igneous rock that crystallizes deep within the earth, if that gets pushed further and further and there's increased pressure and temperature, uh, some of the minerals inside that granite uh, under the new pressure conditions may lo no longer be stable. So what will happen is they'll transform into new minerals, minerals that are stable at those pressures and temperatures. So when metamorphism occurs, uh, it follows changes in mineralogy. And occasionally you'll see changes in chemical composition within the rock. So every metamorphic rock has a parent rock. Right? That's what uh, used to be a different rock before it became a metamorphic rock. And so parent rocks, like let's say a uh, sedimentary rock like sandstone, that can transform into a metamorphic rock. Uh, an igneous rock like granite, that can metamorphose into a metamorphic rock. So here's some examples of metamorphism. Here's the parent rock. This is a sedimentary rock, a detrital sedimentary rock shale. And this is kind of like a subtle form of metamorphism. Under uh, low-grade metamorphism, low temperatures and pressures, uh, it'll metamorphose into slate. Okay, So this is a detrital sedimentary uh, rock. So you'll see little you know, clay minerals sub-parallel to each other, barely visible. I mean, not visible to the naked eye. And then what you'll notice in the slate, the changes that occur uh, on this scale, very subtle, you could see it microscopically, that all those clay minerals, they transform into a new mineral called chlorite and mica, and then they all kind of line up parallel because of the increased pressure. Now a more um, dramatic form of metamorphism, say you start off with a granite type rock, so an intrusive igneous rock, with its minerals kind of forming in random directions, crystallizing from a magma, if it goes under high grade metamorphism, meaning that there's strong compressional forces or high pressure and high temperatures, it'll uh, metamorphose into this high grade metamorphic rock called a folded gneiss. And here you can see distinct bands, compositional bands. So what actually happens is the minerals kind of uh, recrystallize and they also reorganize. And a lot of the light silicates will band together in one layer and then the dark silicates will bend together in another layer. And that's the classic texture of a, a nice, is this uh, banded kind of foliation. OK, so um, metamorphic grade is the degree to which a rock has metamorphosed. So that means that there's differing degrees. I mentioned it earlier, low grade metamorphism and high grade metamorphism. So there is a progression. You can progress from a low-grade rock, and it can continue to metamorphose. And if it's low-grade, that means low temperature and pressures, and that can progress to high-grade, which are uh, metamorphic rocks that have exhibited high temperatures and pressures. But during metamorphism, the rock has to remain solid. Once there's melting involved, then you're back into an igneous environment. So here are your examples. Um, sedimentary environments kind of cover uh, surface conditions to about 200 degrees Celsius, right around here. This is where sediment is converted to sedimentary rock. So you have sediments kind of eroding from rocks on the land surface being deposited in a basin, and those sediments accumulate, and then you'll form sedimentary rocks. But as soon as you cross, uh, as soon as sedimentary rocks cross over, uh, about 200 degrees Celsius, 
this is when you start to get low grade metamorphism. Okay, and then metamorphic grade will increase as temperature increases. Okay, and then here you're in the metamorphic realm from 200 degrees to about 700 degrees Celsius. Okay, and as you progress and get hotter and hotter, you'll go to high grade metamorphism over here. And if you surpass 700 degrees Celsius, the rock will start partially melting because it's so hot. Like the whole rock doesn't melt, just portions of it will begin to melt. Now you're back to an igneous environment. Okay, so really this area here is the metamorphic window, so to speak. Okay, so what drives this metamorphism? Well, the, the most important agent is heat. Heat provides the energy for chemical reactions as uh, it kind of always does on surface conditions as well. Um, and what happens is you get recrystallization. Those are chemical reactions. When you have minerals that are no longer stable under their current temperatures and pressures, they're going to recrystallize into something new, okay, a, a more stable mineral. Uh, a lot of times uh, it'll be larger than the original mineral. There are two sources of this heat that drives metamorphism. One is just it gets hotter the deeper and deeper you go within the earth. And a, our best estimate as to how that changes the deeper and deeper you go, that's called the geothermal gradient. Um, it's about every kilometer of depth you go within the earth, there's an increase in temperature of about 25 degrees Celsius. Okay. Another source of heat uh, are from uh, rising mantle plumes. These are anomalously hot portions of the mantle that rise up and they'll partially melt as they rise. And then those melts kind of kind of meander their way through the crust and provide heat to the existing rocks in the crust and that can cause metamorphism. We call that contact metamorphism. So here's, here's your example. This is a subduction zone. Here's a downgoing ocean plate. Here's the overriding continental plate. Okay, and then as the downgoing plate reaches this portion of the, lith of the asthenospheric mantle, it releases fluids, which lowers the man mantle melting temperatures and creates melts that rise up buoyantly and they rise through the overriding plate. Uh, the vast majority of them never make it to the surface and erupt at volcanoes. A lot of them will just crystallize deep underground and eventually become intrusive igneous rocks. But these melts are what provide heat to the existing rock that's here and can metamorphose it. Okay. Um, this here shows you the idealized geothermal gradient. The deeper you go, the hotter and hotter it gets. So rocks over here are going to start to exhibit um, um, uh, metamorphism as a result of increase of temperature. Now these two plates are kind of colliding with each other and that increases the pressure uh, for the rocks all in this area. So there's going to be metamorphism here as well. And then over on this side of, of the model, uh, this is a, a basin where sediments are accumulating slowly eroding from these highland areas and, and depositing here. Uh, here you'll have uh, also low-grade metamorphism in this environment. So there are a number of environments where you can have metamorphism. Okay, another driver of metamorphism is pressure. Pressure or confining pressure are when all the forces are being applied in equal directions. And you can see that in this image here. This is confining pressure. Um, uh, everything's getting kind of squeezed smaller and smaller uniformly in every direction. This is the same uh, as water pressure. So when you dive into the bottom of the pool, um, you know, you have to equalize, um, blow, you know, yawn or, or close your nostrils and blow and then you pop your ears kind of thing. Um, that's, you're equalizing the increased pressure of the water column above your head. That's confining pressure. And what this does is it causes the spaces in between mineral grains to kind of close apart. Then there's um, differential stress, and that's when you have forces that are unequal and in different directions. So here are those uh, examples here of differential stress, and there's three types. There's compression, where you have the two forces are strongest in this direction, so you're basically like flattening this cube, okay? They're squeezed, the rocks here are squeezed as if they're in a vise. They're shortened in this direction, but what happens is they're elongated in this direction. It's essentially like, say, pretend you had a ball of Play-Doh and you smash it against the uh, desk 
counter that you have, you're going to be creating like a little tortilla or a pancake. Uh, you're shortening that once circular ball of Play-Doh down, but you're elongating it in the kind of XY direction. Okay. So under these conditions, under high pressure conditions and high temperature environments, rocks are ductile, meaning that they can stretch, fold, or even flatten. So here are examples in a, uh, a basin where sediments are accumulating, right? Um, you have a, a confining pressure, pressure equal in all directions. Then um, in an environment where two tectonic plates are colliding, this will create a lot of differential stress and confining uh, um, compressional stress. So the maximum direction of forces are in this direction and it squeezes these rocks together and then elongates them in this direction. So you create a bunch of folds and faults. Okay, here's a pretty cool example of a metamorphic rock. This used to be a sedimentary rock. Can anyone guess what this used to be? Wow, you're right. It was used to be a conglomerate. <laughs> you guys are so smart. Uh, well, here you can tell it was a conglomerate because it's made up of these larger class that are rounded. And these rounded class, I mean, they used to be kind of spherical, but if you notice, they, because of that differential stress, they've been flattened into these kind of oblong shapes. Um, so this used to be a sedimentary conglomerate, and now it's a metamorphic rock. So those are some examples of the pressure exhibited by some rocks. Here in the, in, the, in the background, you can see a rock outcrop that actually causes some folding. You can see, see how these layers are kind of folded over and it kind of distorts uh, what this parent rock used to be into this new uh, metamorphic rock. Another driver of metamorphism uh, we call chemically active fluids. And what chemically active fluids are, all rocks have some water in them, some carbon dioxide, essentially just volatiles. And they're, they can be found in like really minute amounts, but in the chemical structure of, of minerals. And so when you heat these rocks up, you start to drive those volatiles out of the rock, right? And all that water can accumulate and move along pore spaces or fractures or cracks. Um, and it becomes a hot ion rich fluid. And we refer to these as hydrothermal solutions. Okay. And what hydrothermal solutions can do is they can enhance the migration of ions, specifically really large ions, uh, ones that don't really fit in the uh, formulas for uh, minerals. For example, there are a lot of trace elements of uh, economic uh, um, uh, elements like gold and silver and, and those metals typically uh, those ions are, are very large and they may have unusual charge. So those like to go into the hydrothermal solution uh, because they don't really fit in many minerals. So they'll, they'll go in there. Um, but anyways, so these hydrothermal solutions carry all kinds of different dissolved solids in them. Um, and it makes up for some weird chemistry. And so what happens is uh, you get, a lot of times you'll get recrystallization of the existing minerals because of the presence of of uh, dissolved solids in these hydrothermal solutions. So essentially, it, it's the one way that that uh, a metamorphic rock can change in its chemical composition because these hydrothermal solutions can, can um, uh, travel considerable distances, meaning like uh, you say you have a rock that's kind of losing its volatiles and creating a hydrothermal solution. That material can kind of uh, transport its way, you know, kilometers away from its source and then bring new dissolved solids into a new environment and then change the minerals in that environment. Okay, so metamorphic rocks typically have the same overall chemical composition as the original parent rock. Um, the only times changes can occur is if you go from, uh, it, or if chemically active fluids are involved. And if that happens, then you get a loss of a lot of dissolved solids uh, in the hydrothermal solution. So the, the chemistry can change, okay? And that also you can gain some of those volatiles as well. So uh, most of the time, the mineral makeup in a metamorphic rock, uh, that will let us know 
which metamorphic agent was the primary cause of that metamorphism. Like for example, if you find a mineral called sanidine, sanidine is a mineral that only forms under really high temperatures. So if you find a mineral like that, then you can assume that heat was the most important factor. Okay. Um, if you find another mineral that um, uh, only forms from hydrothermal solutions, well then chemically active fluids is probably the culprit uh, for that change. Okay. And then here you can see an example of a granite uh, metamorphosing into a nice. Okay. All right. Let's talk about metamorphic textures. Remember, um, each category of rocks, whether it be sedimentary rocks or igneous rocks, they tell us a story, and we can interpret the information of those rocks from their textures, right? Metam uh, so at igneous rocks, we learned about cooling rate, magmatic history, and composition. Sedimentary rocks, we learned about uh, past life, if there are fossils, or the environment in which that formed in the past, which is pretty cool. Uh, in metamorphic rocks, you find out uh, through the minerals and its texture, uh, how it formed, what its metamorphic history is. Uh, did it form under high-grade metamorphic environments? Um, uh, which chemically, uh, or, or which, what drove that metamorphism and how long it occurred, how long ago it occurred? So uh, metamorphic rocks can display uh, what we call foliation. And foliation is a preferred orientation of minerals where a lot of the platy minerals that crystallize will start to uh, become parallel to subparallel. Okay, so here I'm going to show you two examples. This is a foliated metamorphic rock. So you can clearly, you know, just see that there are uh, bands in this rock, which means the, the kind of the minerals have kind of segregated into these discrete bands. This is considered foliation. Here, this is a metamorphic rock that shows no foliation. So there's two types of metamorphic rocks, foliated ones and non-foliated ones. So here are some examples of foliation. You can have uh, the parallel alignment of platy or elongated minerals. Uh, platy minerals would be like the micas, for example. Um, you can have the parallel alignment or flattening of mineral grains or pebbles, like I showed you in that meta conglomerate. Um, the compositional banding, like I showed you on the last slide. And then some, some metamorphic rocks uh, can split into thin little slabs, and that's a, um, uh, an example of uh, microscopically a lot of these small chlorite minerals have kind of formed in parallel. Okay. So here's a cool example of how this works, essentially. So if we start off with a granite, okay, uh, minerals kind of growing in a, in a random uh, orientation. Remember, those minerals just grow at the expense of the liquid portion of the, of the magma, so they're just randomly oriented. But let's imagine, okay, let's imagine this. Uh, just uh, hold out your fist and pretend you're holding a, a ball of spherical Play-Doh, and let's shove some pennies in it in random orientations to represent the platy minerals that would crystallize in a granite, just all over the place, inside the Play-Doh. Now grab that ball of Play-Doh and smash it on your desk and create that kind of uh, Play-Doh, tortilla, or pancake. What's going to happen to those pennies, right? Those pennies, because you're applying uh, kind of uh, forces, uh, really strong forces that dominate in this direction, and you flatten that rock out, all of those Play-Doh minerals are going to become parallel. And so those pennies inside that Play-Doh are all going to become parallel. And that's what foliation is, or that's why foliation occurs as a result of uh, the process of metamorphism and differential stress. So let's take a look at metamorphic textures in more detail. This is an example of foliated texture or slaty cleavage. This occurs in uh, low-grade metamorphic rocks. And uh, what you see here are uh, some, a slate outcropping um, on the side of a mountain this is where mine is. And you can essentially get a, a, a hammer and chisel and just peel off slabs of this, flat-lying, thin slabs of this rock. And in places in northern Italy and Switzerland, they actually use them as shingles. So these metamorphic textures arise 
uh, from the result of differential stress. Okay, um, and so uh, if you have something like a sedimentary rock with bedding surfaces, um, those bedding surfaces will no longer be flat and start to fold. But within those layers or bedding surfaces, um, the foliation or the, the cleavage will be kind of north and south here or up and down. Uh, and the relic bedding will kind of shine through that. So, uh, so a lot of times when sedimentary rocks that show bedding convert into metamorphic rocks, some people can get confused and think this might be banding, but it's actually the, the relic bedding surfaces. Okay, then there's schistosity. Um, schistosity is when you have uh, platy minerals become discernible with the unaided eye. This is when the metamorphic rocks kind of become pretty and shiny and sparkly and glittery. Okay, so what happens here is the chlorite min minerals are no longer stable and they give way to like biotite and mica and they grow larger. So they grow larger and they have uh, they have kind of a reflective surfaces and they appear like kind of glittery. Okay, they th there's this recrystallization into larger minerals. Um, this still exhibits the layered structure. That's why I kind of showed you this side view. You can still see the layers here. So this is still foliation. We just specifically call this schistosity. And rocks that have this are referred to as a schist. Okay, and then there's nice te te texture. This is another type of foliated texture. But here what you get essentially are uh, bands of... Um, light silicates and dark silicates. So here, the temperatures are so high that you start to see segregation of uh, the minerals. Light silicates group together and dark silicates group together and you create this texture called Nisic banding. Now these don't cleave. This is a very hard rock. In fact, Nices a lot of times are used as um, kitchen countertops because a lot of people like the flow patterns to them or the banding. Uh, because uh, in, a, in a granite, you get a lot of the speckled look, which some people might not like. Okay, so there are other metamorphic textures. There are non-foliated metamorphic rocks, and these are composed of minerals that are equidimensional, and they lack foliation. So they typically form in environments where um, deformation or uh, there's uh, less pressure to kind of squeeze these rocks. Here is a picture of white marble. Um, and this is an example of a non-foliated metamorphic rock. Then there are uh, por poroblastic textures. Here, um, these are metamorphic rocks that have really large minerals that grow out of them called poroblasts. And they're surrounded by a fine-grained matrix of much smaller minerals. So all this here is the matrix, this small stuff. And then these giant garnets here are poroblasts. Um, a lot, in a lot of places, you can find these, and, and they could be gem quality uh, garnets. Look real pretty. All right, so let's talk about some of the common metamorphic rocks. Let's start off with the foliated ones. Um, slate, which is pictured here. This is um, slate. It's very fine grained. It resembles shale. In fact, shale is most often the parent rock. Um, and that's formed from low grade metamorphism. Um, phyllite, which is here, is just a, a step up in terms of metamorphic grade. Um, and here the, the platy minerals have grown in size, but not large enough to see with the unaided eye. Um, and so uh, phyllite will have a little bit of sheen to it. If you hold it up against the light, it will reflect more light off of it. So it looks a little different from slate. And both of these exhibit rock cleavage. So you can chisel these out into kind of uh, slabs. Okay, schist, that's how you say that word, a schist do not. This is a medium to coarse grained metamorphic rock. You can see the minerals grow much larger. It looks very pretty. Okay, the parent rock typically is shale that has undergone medium to high grade metamorphism. Um, it's mainly muscovite and biotites that are present, but it can contain pyroblasts like the garnets I showed you before. Um, and then there's a nice. Uh, nices uh, are higher grade metamorphic rocks. And the, the way you can kind of distinguish them is they don't show any um, slaty cleavage or anything, but they show compositional banding with dark bands and alternating light bands over here. Okay. 
These lighter bands are the feldspar rich layers or light silicates, and the dark ones are the ferromagnesium rich layers. Okay, so this is how we classify metamorphic rocks based on um, their uh, whether or not they're foliated or non-foliated based on their texture. Okay, so here all the rocks we talked about are foliated, which are these here. Okay, going from lowest metamorphic grade slate, and then to phyllite, then to schist, and then the highest metamorphic grade to gneiss. Then here is their texture comparison in, uh, with under the microscope. Okay, here are some descriptions you can read about um, on your own time. Here are the non-foliated metamorphic rocks. Let's talk about those. Marble um, is non-foliated. It forms from limestone. Limestone or dolostone is typically the parent. So that means uh, the main mineral is calcite. And calcite's really soft, right? A lot of that's why um, when you see beautiful pieces of art, sculptures and fountains that are chiseled uh, out of rock, it's typically marble because it's very soft and, and much easier to work with. Uh, granite would take you so much longer, right? Um, but the problem with marble is that because it's calcite, it is very soft, so it weathers very easily in acid rain. Um, so, uh, yeah, marble can be used as tile in bathroom or kitchen countertops, but it's very fragile, and once that sealant wears away, um, you could easily, uh, you know, dissolve portions or weaken uh, your countertop. And marble comes in a variety of different colors, and the colors has to do with the impurities in the marble. Pure marble uh, is white, is just pure white. Then there's quartzite. Quartzite, uh, its parent rock is sandstone, and uh, in this case, remember sandstone's like just a lot of sand just kind of fused together. Um, are just cemented together, excuse me. And when it metamorphoses into uh, uh, a metamorphic rock, those quartz grains just fuse together and are essentially just crystallized. Pure quartzite is white, okay? And then you can have different colors of it. Uh, iron oxide will produce kind of pink stains, okay? Um, some of the cross bedding structures can be preserved. I have a picture in the next slide. Hornfells, uh, that's um, uh, a metamorphic rock where its parent rock is shale. And the way it forms is if uh, a magmatic body is kind of moving through the crust, it'll bake that shale and then it'll create hornfells. Okay, so here's the sedimentary parent rock, quartz sandstone. You can look at all the individual sand grains together that have been cemented, right? The trital sedimentary rock. So if it undergoes metamorphism, it'll become quartzite. And you can see close up, you don't see those sand grains anymore. That's because the quartz is all kind of fused together. This is a very weather resistant rock. Okay, let's, let's discuss the uh, metamorphic environments. And metamorphism occurs in a lot of different environments, um, but they're most of the time found near plate margins. And so they're associated with, with igneous activity. Here are all the different types of metamorphism. We'll go through them all, so don't worry. Uh, this is contact or thermal, hydrothermal, burial, subduction zone, and regional. Here is uh, metamorphic environments kind of mapped out on a graph, okay? Uh, uh, and here on the y-axis is pressure. So this is the surface of the earth. And as you go deeper and deeper within the earth, the pressure uh, increases. All right. And then here synonymously, uh, this is depth. So here's the surface at zero uh, kilometers. And, it, and then here, as we travel down in this direction, we're going deeper and deeper. This is 50 kilometers. And then on the x-axis, we have temperature. So here's zero, te zero degrees Celsius all the way to 1,000 degrees Celsius. And each one of those metamorphic environments encompasses an area on this graph. Contact metamorphism, very hot, very close to the surface. Hydrothermal metamorphism, not as hot and also very close to the surface. Burial and subduction zone metamorphism is um, a very deep type of metamorphism, really high pressure, but lower temperature for the most part. And then regional fills up the rest of the space where you see an increase in temperature and pressure kind of together. So contact metamorphism results from temperature change. And that's when magma invades a host rock. 
And this typically occurs in the upper crust, meaning there's low pressure and high temperature. And surrounding this magma, you'll get a zone of alteration called an aerial. Okay. Let me show you an image here. So here's an active magma chamber right here. And you see this purple layer right here? The, these are the host rock, um, uh, the host rock that is metamorphosed as a result of the heat coming off the magmatic chamber. And after, let's say, the volcano goes extinct and the mag mag magmatic body cools down and crystallizes, um, what you'll see here, here's the metamorphic roof pendant. This is the uh, metamorphosed rock hornfells as a result of that contact metamorphism after this area has been uplifted and eroded and exposed these deep rocks. Here's that igneous pluton, which would be this right here. And so here's another image just showing you a magmatic chamber, okay? The heat is coming off of it in all directions. And then you have, well, you know, classic uh, rocks that you would find in the Earth's crust, shale, quartz, sandstone, and limestone. And limestone will metamorphose into marble, quartz, sandstone to quartzite, and shale to hornfells. And you might see um, kind of in, you know, different shades of purple here. The darker purple means increasing metamorphic grade because it's closer to the magmatic chamber where there's more heat being given off. OK, hydrothermal metamorphism. This is where you have chemical alteration of existing rocks by ion-rich water kind of circulating through the pore spaces and fractures of these rocks. Um, it most often happens in. Uh, in the ocean, actually, at mid-ocean ridges. So let me show you what that looks like. But it can occur on land uh, at hot springs and geysers. Here are the hot spring and geyser examples. If you go out to Yellowstone in Wyoming, they have geysers and hot springs there. And that's because there's a giant plume underneath the American continent there, huge magma chamber close to the surface. That heats up the local meteoric water or groundwater. And you get a lot of circulation of uh, um, hot ion rich material. And that invades the kind of existing um, host rock and deposits these veins. You see that? All these little veins here because that high, hot ion solution kind of moves through these cracks and then deposits um, material. This is where we get a lot of our uh, uh, economic uh, minerals from gold, silver, as a result of hydrothermal vein deposits. This is what they look like. See, here are little uh, quartz veins that are moving through a hydrally thermal or altered host rock. And then uh, at the bottom of the ocean, at these plate boundaries right here, this plate is moving this direction. This one is moving in that direction. Uh, so there's this rift valley here, and this is where the volcanism occurs. We have rising mantle here, provides a lot of heat, and that uh, a lot of the ocean water, because this is at the bottom of the ocean, a lot of the ocean water uh, will infiltrate the, the faults and the cracks that are in, exist in the ocean crust. And as they kind of trickle down, they get heated up by the really hot rock here and all the heat that's being dissipated from the, the magmatic chamber. Um, and that water will heat up, pick up, pick up a lot of dissolved solids along the way, and then erupt at these black smokers. Uh, at the kind of rift valley right here. The black smokers would kind of be right here and then erupt here. And so that chemically alters... Wow, I made a lot of red lines here. Let's erase it all. Uh, it'll uh, create a lot of hydrothermal rocks here because of all that water circulation. And here are some examples of that rock. Serpentinite, this is exactly ocean crust or basalt that has been metamorphosed. A lot of times you'll see uh, kind of quartz veins move through them, okay? And then here's soapstone. Uh, two other metamorphic environments are uh, burial metamorphism. This is where you have a lot of sedimentary rocks kind of piling up in a uh, basin, a low-lying area that's sinking. So here, confining pressure and a little bit of heat is what drives the recrystallization uh, in these areas. And then there's subduction zones. Here, I showed you here, here's a subducting plate, okay? And here's this overriding plate. They're moving against each other, so that creates a lot of uh, pressure in that environment. So here, pressure increases drastically uh, um, 
in comparison to heat. So a lot of the metamorphism that occurs in subduction zones is related to high differential stress. And then the most widespread type of metamorphism is regional metamorphism. This produce the most, produces the most metamorphic rock, and it's associated with uh, mountain building uh, and the collision of continental blocks. So here the crust is shortened, thickened, folded, and faulted. So here's an example. Uh, here's it. This is uh, the Indian um, tectonic plate, and this is the Eurasian tectonic plate. So essentially this is the formation of uh, the Himalayas. Um, and then here you get a collision of continental crust against continental crust. You create mountains, and as you do this, uh, you create an entire array of low-grade metamorphic rocks on the outskirts. Then closer to the roots of the mountains, you get the high-grade metamorphic rocks. And it's because of increased pressure and temperature together from these colliding continental blocks. All right, there are textural variations with each metamorphic zone. So as you increase metamorphic grade, that comes with changes in texture in the rock. And we've kind of talked about this. So if you, if you start off with slate, um, you have really small minerals, but they're all kind of parallel and aligned with each other. Uh, when you move up to phyllite, the minerals grow a little larger, but then the foliation is kind of wavy. Okay. Then to schist, then you can start seeing the minerals in a schist. They're large enough. And again, these are kind of show up in layers or parallel to each other. And then if you go to even higher metamorphic grade, into a nice, then you start to see the compositional banding of light and dark silicates. All right, another way of kind of determining uh, metamorphic grade or the metamorphic zone that you're in is through index minerals. So there are a lot of changes in mineralogy as you go from low grade to high grade metamorphism. And there are some minerals that are good indicators of metamorphic grade. And so we call those index minerals. Okay. So here, um, here is uh, three metamorphic zones, low grade, intermediate grade, and high grade. And here's the typical mineralogy you'd run into. Um, if you find chlorite, which is kind of a greenish mineral, um, that indicates that that metamorphic rock has undergone low-grade metamorphism. And to metamorphic geologists, that would mean, hey, this occurred in this type of environment. It reached these pressures at this depth and at these temperature ranges. So it provides information on the history of the rock and the pro geologic processes that it has undergone. Okay, if you start seeing uh, something like muscovite and biotite, that would be kind of more indicative as uh, you're moving toward intermediate grade. Um, if you find garnet, like we saw in those garnetiferous schists, um, that would be indicative of intermediate grade or even higher. Okay, And there are other minerals like starlite exclusively occurs in the higher end of the intermediate grade. And then sylmanite is a mineral that's a good indicator of high grade metamorphism. Uh, minerals like quartz and feldspar are very common and they occur in each metamorphic grade, high, medium, and low. So they're, they're not index minerals because they occur at every single level. They don't tell you anything. If you find a feldspar in your metamorphic rock, it's like, okay, it won't really uh, help you determine what, uh, to what pressure or temperature uh, your metamorphic rock uh, reached, high grade, low grade, or intermediate grade. Right? And this is an example of a garnet. These are the garnets you can find in metamorphic rocks. And it's important because it helps you determine different metamorphic zones. And so uh, here in the Northeast, these are New England states, uh, based on the metamorphic rocks um, that are exposed from the really old Appalachian Mountains, we can determine zones of those metamorphic rocks and find out kind of like where the roots of these mountains were during this regional metamorphism. So these areas in ray, red, rayid, I don't know why I said it like that, but red, um, these areas are uh, places of high grade metamorphism. Okay, and then surrounding that intermediate and as you go further and further away, you have low grade metamorphic rocks. This is a migmatite. Um, what a migmatite is, I kind of skipped over that 
definition in a previous slide, but migmatite is like borderline igneous rock. It's like the transition from metamorphic rock to igneous rock. Um, and that occurs in really high temperatures. And what happens is the, the rock actually partially melts, and here's that melt portion. And this dark area here is the portion that didn't melt. And then it cools down and then it preserves itself as what we refer to as a magnemetite. Okay, so that kind of concludes metamorphic rocks. Let's just talk about rocks in general. And we extract a lot of resources from all the different rocks and minerals, like gold, silver, copper, mercury, lead. Those are used for all different types of industrial uses, the power of phones and computers. Okay. Um, and the concentrations of those economic minerals uh, are concentrated in, in, in rocks or uh, in higher concentrations uh, through igneous and metamorphic processes, right? Like if you have circulating hydrothermal solutions, uh, then you might find some gold. Okay, so here's some examples. Um, most important ore deposits are generated through that hydrothermal or hot water solution circulations, okay? So here's an example. This is an actual gold uh, vein right here. So there's a hydrothermal solution that solidified, and it carried along with it higher concentrations of gold. And that's what to, that's why you hear, you know, miners are like, oh, um, I've been following this vein for a while and, and mining that out. Okay. So the heat that drives this uh, hydrothermal circulation is typically with cooling magmatic bodies. Okay. So you have cooling magma here, um, and that releases a lot of heat. And then you have a lot of uh, groundwater or meteoric water interacting with that hot rock and then removing ions and depositing them in other places. Uh, and as a result of that, um, a lot of times what you'll find near these cooling magmatic bodies are pegmatites. Pegmatites is a fancy word for um, a, a specific type of rock uh, that has huge, unusually large crystals. Um, see this image here? This is a regular sized man. This is one mineral of feldspar. So this looks like it's almost seven feet long or something. Here's another one, maybe four feet long. Um, so under these environmental conditions, it allows the minerals to kind of grow really, really large, these fluid rich environments. There are a lot of crazy images. I uh, recommend Googling large I think it's selenite minerals in a cave in Mexico, and you'd be pleasantly surprised. There are a lot of uh, unique environments where you have circulating groundwater and allows the minerals to kind of grow really large. So here's another example, magmatic chamber. Um, you'll have pegmatite deposits uh, kind of branching off and away from the magmatic chambers. Here are the hydrothermal vein deposits. Here's a quartz vein with little skinny uh, gold uh, veins kind of moving through it. Okay. Okay, so here are the resources humans use um, on average every year. Uh, I know I was kind of surprised by this too, but uh, if you take into account, you know, your drive to school, I guess you're not driving to school, um, but when you were or your drive to work, you have to use all that road. So you use a lot of non-metallic resources like stone, Okay, we use a lot of energy resources like oil, coal, and natural gas to power our, our precious air conditioning units, right? And we use a lot of metals for, you know, computers, wiring our house, all of our appliances. So we use a lot of uh, resources that are found in, in rocks. Um, some of the uh, non-metallic mineral resources. Um, we use for their physical or chemical properties. Uh, two main groups, building materials. So limestone is uh, big on that. Gyps gypsum makes up a lot of drywall. So that's a lot of building materials. Then there's industrial uses for those uh, non-metallic mineral resources. Uh, we use this fertilizer and steel making. Uh, we use mercury. Well, that's a metal, Never mind. But you get my drift. Okay, and then there's coal. Coal. Um, essentially is just uh, organic rich material that's been buried for millions and millions of years. And we found out like if you burn it, it releases a lot of heat and that can generate energy. So we've been using coal for a while. Here are all the areas uh, in the U.S. that have outcrops of coal. The best coal is anthracite here. 
and we find those in areas in kind of like West Virginia and Western Pennsylvania. Um, but you can still use bituminous coal um, to generate energy. The coal industry is kind of really taking a big hit. The prices have fallen. It's getting very expensive to um, to mine out coal, and that's it's largely because of the uh, easy or the technology that's resulted from being able to extract natural gas. Natural gas has become a huge part of uh, um, the um, American uh, energy consumption. Uh, the problem with coal is that it causes a lot of air pollution. It puts mercury in the air, and to mine it out, it creates crazy surface scarring and a lot of the uh, kind of uh, beautiful temperate forests that are out here. All right, oil and natural gas makes up 60% of the U.S. consumed energy, um, and those are the remains of marine plants and animals. Yep, that's what it is, crazy enough. Um, so uh, those microscopic marine organisms that create these little oil droplets to help them keep themselves floating in the ocean, when they die, they accumulate on the bottom of the ocean, and if enough of them accumulate, that eventually can, can become oil. Okay, And oil is stored in what we refer to as source rocks, and uh, we mine them out. But there's a newer uh, form of um, extracting uh, natural gas uh, from the ground, and that's through uh, hydraulic fracking. Um, hydraulic fracturing, it's short for fracking. And what that does is that shatters shale with a lot of um, uh, chemicals and water, and what it does is that kind of extracts the methane that's in it. So you have, here you have like a, a drilling well, and then they, they shoot down all kinds of uh, fracking chemicals and water to break up um, the rock here, and then uh, up comes uh, the methane, and they collect that as natural gas. Um, and there's a lot of natural gas out there, and there's a lot of fracking going on, uh, which has driven energy prices lower, um, but there are some environmental costs to this. Uh, a lot of people will um, lease out portions of their land to these companies to do that, and they make a lot of money, maybe $2,000 a month or something, uh, which they find very useful. But um, the problem is a lot of these uh, fracking chemicals can break up down here and contaminate the groundwater. Um, and so if you're pulling up water from this private uh, uh, private well, uh, there have been cases where people's water is flammable because it's full of methane gas now, and then their water sources are ruined. So, so yeah, there are a lot of problems uh, with hydraulic fracking.